A British economist, A.W. Phillips, observed an interesting relationship between inflation and unemployment. Looking at data from Britain over a very long period of time, he saw that there was an inverse relationship between the unemployment rate and the inflation rate. That is, when the unemployment rate was low, the rate of inflation tended to be high, and vice versa. In this discussion, we're going to try to account for Philip's observation as we develop a tool that represents his conclusion called the Phillips curve. We want to start with the question, what causes inflation? And there really are two components to the answer. First of all, rising prices or inflation are associated with competition for scarce resources. When the economy is being driven very, very hard and more jobs are being created and factories are trying to buy raw materials to expand their output, when the economy is growing rapidly, that tends to create inflation as businesses compete for scarce resources like labor and raw materials. So that's one thing. The inflation rate is going to represent scarcity that occurs when the economy is growing faster. When the economy is growing slower, then there's going to be less price pressure and the inflation rate will tend to be lower. The second thing that can cause inflation is simply people's expectations. When people believe that they are in a period of inflation, they're going to include a demand for higher wages in any contracts they negotiate. After all, if the inflation rate is 5%, then I believe the cost of living will rise 5% this year. I'm going to ask my boss to include a cost of living adjustment in my wage contract so that my wages rise along with the prices of goods and services and my standard of living doesn't get shrunken by inflation. Now, what happens, of course, is if wages are rising by 5%, my employer has to pass those costs on to customers by increasing his or her prices by 5%. So wages rising causes prices to rise, which causes wages to rise and prices to rise again, so that the expectation of inflation gets embedded in the economy and it becomes kind of self-perpetuating. So, two things that cause inflation. Demand for raw materials pushes up costs and causes businesses to increase prices. That's the relationship between the growth of the economy and rising prices. The second thing is expectations. Once the economy gets used to inflation, inflation just perpetuates itself. Now, with this in mind, we can draw a relationship between the inflation rate in the economy and the unemployment rate. This relationship is called the Phillips Curve. To set up our Phillips Curve, let me offer a couple of definitions. The first definition we're going to call the natural rate of unemployment, or the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. This is the rate of unemployment that is associated with a stable rate of inflation. The natural rate of unemployment is associated with the level of output that does not cause prices to increase at an increasing rate. Suppose the economy is at this natural rate of uh, unemployment. If it's there, then any attempt to increase output in the economy faster is going to start to drive up prices at an accelerating rate as there's intense competition for labor and other raw materials. On the other hand, if the economy grows more slowly than the speed limit, there's going to be slack. There's going to be uh, extra unemployment and unused raw materials, which will put downward pressure on their prices, lowering costs, and causing inflation to occur at a slower rate. So here's the break point in the economy, the natural rate or non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. It's the speed limit of the economy. Try to drive the economy faster and inflation accelerates. Drive the economy slower and you get a lower rate of inflation. The next thing I want to define is the underlying rate of inflation in the economy. And this underlying rate of inflation in the economy is driven probably by the growth rate of the money supply. The faster the money supply grows, the faster prices tend to rise. But it's also heavily influenced, heavily, by people's expectations. If people expect or get used to a higher rate of inflation, that higher rate of inflation gets built into wage contracts and so forth, becoming the underlying rate of inflation for the economy. Now, this underlying rate will adjust over time either as the growth rate of the money supply changes or as people's expectations change. If people expect a lower rate of inflation, they start requesting smaller wage increases from year to year, and the rate of increase in prices slows down.
All right, so we've defined two things. We've defined the natural rate of unemployment, which for the sake of our example, we're going to assume is 5%. And we've defined an underlying rate of inflation. That's the rate of inflation that you would get if the economy is right at the speed limit, right at the break point before inflation will be pressed to accelerate by driving the economy faster. So let's put a point here. Uh, suppose the underlying inflation rate for the economy is uh, 5%. So if we put a 5% inflation rate here on this axis, then we start with this point right here. If we are at our speed limit, we have 5% inflation. Now, what's going to happen if we decide we want to drive the economy faster? If we drive the economy faster, we're going to get a lower unemployment rate. That is, we're going to be pulling people into jobs that are presently not finding them. So if you drive the economy faster, you get something that's good. You get more output and you get less unemployment. So here's what we get. However, driving the economy faster means that you are pushing the labor market into shortage. You're creating a tighter labor market. It's harder to hire people now, and wages begin to rise. And with those rising wages from competition for labor, you get rising prices, which is a bad thing. So to countervail or to balance the good thing, we get a little bit of bad, too. So what we get is another point here with less unemployment. Maybe the unemployment rate is pushed down to 4%. However, the cost of that reduction in unemployment is a higher inflation rate. Maybe it goes up to 7%. So here's another point that's possible for the economy. And we can keep having trade-offs here. We can increase output more, reducing unemployment further, but at the cost of a more rapid uh, increase in prices. And if you want to push it even further, you can have even more inflation. The more we reduce unemployment in this story, the faster you're going to push prices upward as the labor market gets tighter and tighter and tighter and wages start rising more and more rapidly. So what you get then here is an inverse relationship between the inflation rate and the unemployment rate. The harder you drive the economy, the lower the unemployment rate goes. However, this intense competition for labor begins to push up wages and prices faster. It's like a trade-off. And the same thing would be true if we went the other way. If we wanted to reduce inflation in our economy, we could do it. We could get rid of some of this um, increase in prices, but the cost would be we would push some workers out of a job. And we can keep making this trade-off, less inflation, but if we have less inflation, we're going to be producing less output, which means more unemployment. So the curve goes the other direction. That is, you can get lower inflation rates, but only if you're willing to accept a higher unemployment rate. That's the way the trade-off works. This inverse relationship between the inflation rate and the unemployment rate, this menu of possibilities is called the Phillips curve, after A.W. Phillips, who looked at the wage data from Britain. Now, suppose that we try to drive the economy faster than its speed limit in the long run. Suppose we try to violate the speed limit and we're back here at 4% unemployment, which is an unemployment rate that is below the natural rate. We're trying to produce too much. We're trying to pull too much labor into the market. What's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is people are going to get tired of working over time. They're going to start asking for higher wages. And eventually what happens is the economy starts to adjust. And as prices rise in the economy, then people are going to say to themselves, huh, it's really not worth it to work these extra hours. And people are going to go back to their old habits of labor and leisure. And the economy is going to find itself back, as we'll see uh, in our next discussion, it's going to find itself back at the natural rate of unemployment in the long run. However, because we've been driving the economy harder, people are now used to 7% inflation. And because they're used to 7% inflation, they are including that expectation in their demands for higher wages every year. So 7% becomes the underlying rate of inflation for the economy because people have come to expect it. That means when the economy adjusts back to full employment, as it, in its natural course of things, returns to full employment, now it's going to return to full employment with a higher rate of inflation than before because people's expectations have changed. So I can draw a new Phillips curve now. The, the range of possible trade-off has been changed. We now, if we're at full employment, are going to have the new underlying rate of 7% as our inflation rate, and now we can choose trade-offs along this dotted Phillips curve. The Phillips curve shifts upwards when people get used to a higher rate of inflation. When the underlying or expected rate of inflation moves up, 
usually because we've spent some time over here in an overheated economy, then the whole Phillips curve shifts up because now you've got to coax people harder if you want to get them to work faster than the speed limit. You've got to give them even more wage increases. So trying to keep the economy over here running faster than the speed limit winds up shifting the Phillips curve upwards as the underlying rate of inflation, the expected rate of inflation, gets pushed up. Now in the long run, you're always going to wind up on the speed limit. That is, in the long run, we can't hold the economy faster than the speed limit. Prices are going to start to rise so rapidly that eventually we just find ourselves back on this curve. Again, we'll see how that works in the next discussion when we look at the aggregate demand and aggregate supply representation of Phillips idea. But let me say right now, the Phillips curve in the long run is vertical. It's vertical because in the long run, you've got to be at the full employment level of unemployment. In the long run, you've got to be at the natural rate because otherwise you're going to be in a situation of instability. As long as you're over here running the economy faster than the speed limit, the Phillips curve tends to shift upwards. As long as you're over here with a higher unemployment rate, there's going to be downward pressure on the inflation rate and the Phillips curve is going to tend to shift downward. The only stable Phillips curve occurs whenever you are on the natural rate of unemployment. It's only when you're on the green line that the Phillips curve doesn't tend to shift up or downward over time. So let's look at how our theory jibes with some actual data for the United States. If we look at the data from the 1960s, we see a very smooth downward sloping trade-off between the unemployment rate on the horizontal axis and the inflation rate on the vertical axis. As the economy built up to the Vietnam War, the rate of inflation was pushed up as government spending and a defense buildup drove the economy very, very hard. That is, we pushed ourselves um, faster than the speed limit the unemployment rate fell below the natural rate and the rate of price increase began to rise. So what we get in the 1960s appears to be the Phillips curve of our, of our theory. However, what happened in the 1970s made a mockery of that Phillips curve. Here we had our Phillips curve, but then in the 1970s we wind up with all these data points that involve more inflation and more unemployment than the points on this curve. That is, it appears that the whole Phillips curve has shifted upwards. This is called stagflation, when the inflation rate increases at the same time that the unemployment rate increases. Now, what would cause the Phillips curve to shift outward? Here in 1970, 72, and 73, we've got a trade-off at a higher level, that is, more inflation for any given amount of unemployment. Probably because, as inflation began to pick up in the late 1960s, people in the economy digested this and it became part of their expectations. That is, as people got used to an inflation rate above 4%, they factored that into their demands for wages and businesses got used to increasing their prices at a faster rate than before. So the data from the 1960s taken with the data from the 1970s matches pretty well the picture we drew a minute ago, which is as long as inflation expectations remain constant, you get a smooth downward sloping trade-off. However, when inflation expectations increase, then you get a new curve that's further out. Now, this suggests that it may be possible in the short run to make a choice between inflation and unemployment. However, in the long run, that's not going to be possible because in the long run, people will get used to a higher rate of inflation. They build that into their expectations and they become unwilling to work unless wages begin to increase at an even more rapid rate. So in the long run, the Phillips curve is going to be vertical. In the short run, however, there's a possibility of a trade-off between inflation and unemployment.